Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Pat McCormick, president of City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who join us here today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today, we're honored to have Senator Ron Wyden, new chair of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, address the club on advancing U.S. energy. But first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum winter sponsors, Bank of the Cascades, CenturyLink, Miller Nash, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon, and The Standard. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of you. We are pleased to welcome a new executive director to lead the City Club into its 100th anniversary. Sam Adams is a longtime City Club member and over the past 20 years has attended City Club events, shared the Friday Forum stage, and served as a witness for a number of the City Club's comprehensive and ballot measure study committees. Sam brings a compelling vision and personal passion for civic engagement and public policy to this position. He also has deep knowledge of the community and a diverse network of relationships throughout the region. Please join me in a round of applause to thank the search committee for all their hard work in this process and to welcome Sam into his new role. City Club is launching a ballot measure study committee on the water fluoridation measure coming before Portland voters later this spring. If you'd like to be part of this ballot measure study, make sure you get your applications in by the end of the day today. You can find copies of the study charge and application online and, the, and at the membership table at the back of the room. Membership in City Club matters. It connects you to your city and fellow citizens gives you a voice in public policy, and offers you both serious and fun ways to learn about critical issues facing our community. As part of our membership drive, which launched this month, new members can save $25 on the membership, and every new member, and members who refer new members, will be entered into a drawing uh, to have lunch or coffee with club members, including Earl Blumenauer, Steve Novick, Dan Saltzman, Ted Wheeler, Jeff Kogan, and others. Today we are drawing the name of a person who will have lunch with Ellen Rosenblum, the Oregon Attorney General. This week's winner is, the first winner in our weekly membership draw, drive drawing is new member Michael Campbell, founder of Document Access Network. Michael and a guest will be enjoying lunch with Oregon Attorney General and City Club member Ellen Rosenblum. Congratulations, Michael. Next week, we are pleased to welcome Steve Wright, the Chief Executive of the Bonneville Power Administration. He will talk about the value of the Northwest public hydropower system and the importance of maintaining economic prosperity and ecological health. You can learn more about the future City Club events such as this on our website at pdxcityclub.org. We'll be having a more lengthy than usual Q&A session with the Senator after his presentation today. You are welcome to ask questions beyond the issues he discusses today. Members, please come to the microphone as usual to ask your question. For all audience members, please locate the index cards at the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the forum. We will collect them prior to the start of the Q&A session. And now our program. After decades of policies to cope with scarce oil and gas resources, America suddenly must answer totally new questions. What do we do with potentially massive new energy reserves? How can policymakers leverage the shale gas revolution while encouraging renewable power and moving toward a low carbon economy? And how will this new energy future fuel continued growth for Oregon? As always, Senator Wyden plans to put people first 
ensuring that the policies introduced in 2013 are written with families, workers, and employers in mind. Ron Winded is the chair of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources for the 113th Congress, a committee that influences policy on energy, national parks, public lands, and water. Whether he's taking on powerful interests, listening to constituents at one of his famous town halls, or standing up for Oregonians on the floor of the U.S. Senate, Ron Wyden is an effective leader on issues that matter most. Wyden believes the nation's biggest challenges can only be solved by what he calls principled bipartisanship, solutions that allow all parties to stay true to their respective principles and celebrate agreements. Following that approach has helped him author more than 150 bipartisan bills and assemble unprecedented bipartisan coalitions on issues such as health care, infrastructure, and tax reform. And without further ado, please help me welcome Oregon Senator Ron Wyden. Thank you so much for that uh, unquestionably inflationary introduction. <laughs> a couple of days ago, I was introduced repeatedly as Oregon's senior senator, and people really couldn't figure out what to make of that. And finally, I said, look, keep this in perspective, because at one time, Fritz Hollings of South Carolina was his state's junior senator <laughs> at the age of 80, <laughs> which prompted my uh, older daughter recently to say, Dad, I'm really studying the Senate now. There's so much going on. And some of those guys are really getting up there. <laughs> so, Dad, you're in the only profession on earth where somebody your age is actually one of the young guys. <laughs> so I think it's an important time to talk a bit about some of the big issues coming up in front of the Senate, but I also want to do a little bit of business even beforehand. I know that you're going to have a new director, Sam Adams, and the history of the City Club has always been to be on the cutting edge of innovation and new ideas, and I'm certain Sam is going to keep you there. Sam, look forward to welcoming you, and I know the club does as well. And in, in the Senate, there is this kind of tradition, they call it a point of personal privilege, and. I'm going to sort of rent the tradition today because as somebody who dreamed of playing in the NBA as a kid, I heard that Bill Shonley was in the house. Is that true? If Bill Shonley is here, if he'll rise and let's give Bill Shonley, Mr. Oregon, a big round of applause. Mr. Oregon, Bill Shonley. With Decisions dating back a century. Our state has a legacy of leadership on energy and natural resources that rivals any state in the country. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about how we built that legacy and then spend most of our time together talking about how we can do it once more. It was just over 75 years ago that Franklin Roosevelt signed the Bonneville Power Act. And I think we all understand that changed the Pacific Northwest forever. It created construction jobs for Depression-era workers, brought electricity to homes, allowed businesses to build and prosper here, and it transformed the Columbia River into one of this country's great transportation systems. Bonneville provided reliable, affordable power 
unlike anywhere else in the country. And that power helped build the country's arsenal of ships and planes that won World War II, especially the aluminum smelters that provided critical metals for aircraft manufacturing. Because of that work, the Pacific Northwest took its place on the frontier of energy innovation by showing the vital link between affordable energy and creating jobs. And Bonneville also proved something to the rest of the country that our nation built on. And that is so often private investment will follow well-targeted public investments. And Bonneville and Oregon and the Northwest led the way. Now, let's go back even further to 1891 when President William Henry Harrison signed the law creating the National Forest System. It wasn't long after that that the government created national forest reserves in our state. And they were the precursors to today's national forests. The first one, created in 1892, was a portion of what is now the Mount Hood National Forest. The wealth and the beauty contained in our forests brought newcomers from across the country and made timber our state's most important natural resource. In the aftermath of World War II, when all of those soldiers were coming home, America's rising middle class created a huge new demand for housing. It was Oregon's forests and Oregon's timber industry that provided the lumber that made it possible to meet that demand. By 1961, our forests provided one-fourth of the softwood lumber, half of the plywood, and more than a quarter of the hardwood, hardboard production produced in our country. It was Oregon and its natural resources that made the American dream of home ownership possible and provided millions of people across the United States with a better quality of life. That's our history. That's a short look at where we've been. And now I'd like to talk about where we can go again and how, once again, we can lead America on energy and natural resources. First, the obvious. The U.S. economy does not get very far without safe, affordable power and balanced, sustainable resources. We've either been generating here in our state power, in the case of hydro and wind and other types of renewable energy, or otherwise we would import it. Natural gas and for certainly many decades past, coal. We've got energy dependent industries in Oregon from the mills in southwestern Oregon to manufacturers like Oregon Ironworks here in the city and frozen vegetable processors in eastern Oregon. And that's not to mention the tech companies, Intel, server farms for Apple, Facebook, and Google in the gorge in central Oregon. We've got ports and manufacturers all over the state who see economic opportunities in overseas markets to drive job creation here at home. And one out of six jobs in our state depends on exports. If you ever ask me what I think the Oregon economic philosophy ought to be all about, is we ought to grow things here, we ought to make things here, we ought to add value to them here, and then we ought to ship them somewhere. That's going to take affordable energy. So energy and the economy are intertwined. And now, for the first time in decades, there's a brand new development, a development that for all practical purposes, adults have really not seen. For years, we have, of course, been dependent on foreign energy sources. Now, almost overnight, we are talking about being energy independent. And Oregon and other parts of the country are being asked to become energy exporters. Now, this is primarily because of technological advances 
These advances unlocked vast new reserves of natural gas and shale oil. Natural gas, 50% cleaner than the other uh, fossil fuels. So there is something of real significance right there because Oregon clearly is looking at ways to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And I think now, here at the City Club and in similar kinds of discussions around the country, we can start thinking through the issues, the important issues that these new developments have brought. And to illustrate how quickly the country has moved from importing energy to exporting energy, I wanted to take you through just a couple of recent Oregon newspaper headlines. In 2008 and 2009 on the Oregon coast, the papers were full of articles about the pros and the cons of importing natural gas through the ports on the Oregon coast. On December 4th of 2008, the Daily Astorian reported on a meeting on energy imports in Clatsop County that got so rowdy, two people had to be escorted out of the building by sheriff's deputies. Now, just a short time later, we're having some of the same, let us say, spirited debates about whether or not to export natural gas. So last October, the historian reported, and I quote, emotions were high and the Warrenton Community Center was packed to the seams. People wanted their say on LNG exports. So as billions of dollars were spent around the country building these import facilities, now we're having a debate about whether we ought to spend billions of dollars more in setting up export facilities. The Energy Information Agency, in particular, is a study worth thinking about. They're the smart people who look at all the numbers and all the trends. And the Energy Information Agency estimated in 2007 that the United States would be importing more and more natural gas each year. Those are our experts, folks, in 2007, said we're going to import more and more natural gas each year. It wasn't until last year that that agency, the designated set of experts for the government, did an about face and started predicting that America would have enough natural gas to send it overseas. Now, my own view is natural gas is a strategic advantage for the United States. We've got it, and other countries want it. Employers in the United States pay about five times less for natural gas than their competitors in Asia. Carbon emissions are falling as the utilities retire old coal plants and rely more on cleaner natural gas-fired power. The implications of the natural gas trend ripple all the way through our economy. I want it understood that I believe there are significant environmental issues associated with natural gas. Fracking is one, methane gas is a second, underground aquifers would be a third, but there is no question that when the Energy Information Agency says that CO2 emissions have dropped and that the evidence indicates that it is primarily due to plants shifting from dirtier coal to natural gas, that this is something we ought to think through as a country and as a Congress. The business press is reporting, for example, that a number of major U.S. companies that have set up operations overseas are talking about coming back in order to have uh, job growth in the United States tied to those low uh, energy prices. Greg Cantor, who heads Northwest Natural Gas here at home, tells me that even in our community, industrial customers are coming 
to Northwest Natural with new opportunities to expand industrial production because of new North American natural gas supplies. And this trend is not just about natural gas, the trend to energy exports. The United States exported finished oil products last year for the first time in 50 years. For the first time in 50 years, we exported finished oil products. And now experts are predicting that within a few years, we're going to export crude oil. Let me just repeat that. After all of these years of imports, now we have predictions that the United States might be exporting crude oil. So given these very dramatic developments in the space of just a few years, what should the policy of our government be? And here's the question that I think is front and center. And that is, are there policies that can help our country find an energy sweet spot for the future? For example, are there policies that allow some natural gas to be exported to keep American gas plants operating while keeping gas prices affordable for our businesses and consumers and at the same time providing a path to greater use of renewable energy? I want to tell you that the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee is going to spend a lot of time looking for that sweet spot. Now, this debate about energy exports and what I call the sweet spot associated with those policies is taking place against the backdrop of what is unquestionably the premier environmental issue of our time, and that is the urgency of climate change. Oregonians know it. At one of my town hall meetings over the last couple weeks, six of the first eight questions were about climate change. And Oregonians are right. Climate change is real. I know that there are some who don't see it that way. I am not one of them. The planet is getting warmer. The droughts are getting worse. The forest fires are getting more catastrophic. And the storms are getting bigger. My view is inaction on climate change is not an option. Last week. Last week, 13 federal agencies issued a draft of the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Among other things, they looked at impacts in different parts of the country from climate change. The assessment makes it very clear that as Americans, we are going to have our hands full. Bigger swaths of our forests are going to burn. Our fish are going to be swimming in warmer, more acidic waters. And the Pacific Ocean along the Oregon coast is projected to rise by two feet by 2100. At a recent hearing that was held looking at the oceans, there were several experts there, and they kept looking at Maria Cantwell of Washington and myself. So this is not an abstract issue for the Pacific Northwest. A warmer Pacific Northwest also means less snow on the mountains, which means less water for the farmers, and people who boat and fish fewer days for folks to ski and snowboard and less hydropower. But there is also substantial good news for us. I really do see a role for natural gas as transitioning our country to an economy that no longer relies almost exclusively on fossil fuels, but does, as you will hear us talk often, in the Energy Committee does considerably more to promote a low carbon economy. Now, a smart beginning 
would be to change federal tax policy on energy tax incentives so those incentives are technology neutral. It doesn't make sense to have one tax credit for wind, another for solar, a third for geothermal uh, power, and then a whole array of breaks for oil and gas. I also serve on the Finance Committee, so we'll have a chance to pursue this intersection between energy policy and tax policy. But in a nutshell, what I think is in Oregon's interest with respect to federal tax incentives on energy is neutrality and parity. And if we have that, not only will we start creating more competition that will be good for consumers, but I can see the day in Oregon where somebody pulls up to what I call an energy filling station, not a gas station, an energy filling station. The consumer gets to choose between electric or natural gas or biofuels or gasoline or flex fuels, and the end game is more competition, a real marketplace, and a cleaner economy. That's the kind of future I see for us. A second response where Oregon can lead on the climate change question is in the area of energy efficiency. Since 1980, the Northwest has acquired some two Grand Coulee dams worth of energy efficiency. That's two Grand Coulees worth of coal plants, gas plants we don't have to build because we invested in saving energy instead. And the Northwest Power and Conservation Council says there's at least another couple of two Grand Coulees worth of energy efficiency. Another 6,000 average megawatts still to be captured over the next 20 years and at bargain prices. Related to that question of energy efficiency is the critical issue that has just begun to get some attention and that's the issue of energy storage. We need to do more to store energy, and particularly renewable energy, which of course is intermittent power. It runs when the weather is right, so we ought to be doing more to store it. The Bonneville Power Administration especially can play a key role because storage is so critical if we're going to tap in Oregon the full potential of wind and solar, and we're all thrilled as we drive eastward in our state to see the opportunities, particularly for wind power. Energy storage is critically linked to our ability to tap those opportunities, and Bonneville's role is essential. Also east of the Cascades, biomass is an area where, again, Oregon can lead. We have a company, Ziachem, which has a demonstration refinery in Boardman. They're creating cellulosic ethanol and other bio-based bio products that are going to reduce the amount of oil the United States would again be looking at having to bring from other countries. This is the kind of innovative project the federal government ought to be encouraging and is another step on the path to what I've described as the low carbon economy. And I was pleased this morning to see in the paper that our state is really coming together to promote wave energy and to look at the oceans as an important source of power as well. It's an energy innovation that of course is a natural for us with our coast. Oregon State University has been one of the pioneers in this uh, area of testing wave power uh, sites near Newport and Ocean Power, and I heard that Oregon State is out in force. Where are the beavers? Let's give them a big round of applause for the work they're doing. They're doing to help us get some of the first commercial wave projects uh, in the country. I want to wrap up this part of the program talking about one of the biggest challenges that is facing rural communities across the country. And we see it here at home in what's called the county payments law. 
where again, going back in, in time, when the federal forest system was created, we were told we'd get money for our schools and our roads and our police tied to cutting timber on federal lands. And that worked pretty great for about 90 years. And then as the environmental laws you know, changed, we had to take steps to fill in that money. And probably the most important law I've written in my time in uh, the Congress has been that timber payments law that's brought Oregon about two and a half billion dollars since 2000. We're hurting in rural communities and schools and roads and police and we're worried about what's going to happen with Curry County and Douglas and Coos and, and the others. Even with that two and a half billion dollars, there's a world of hurt out there and we are not alone. And I want to kind of paint a bit of a picture here because all over the United States, there are communities that adjoin federal land and federal water that are having almost the same discussions we're having in Oregon. There are very pragmatic people in all these communities basically sitting trying to figure out how they can come up with policies that will create more good paying jobs in resource dependent communities and at the same time protect our land and water and our, our treasures. So it's almost as if there is a natural coalition out there that can work together to get rural America and rural Oregon off this fiscal roller coaster they have been in these past years. And one of the things we're going to try to do on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee is to try to build a coalition of communities across the country and lawmakers who represent those communities so that everybody who's got a stake in a balanced, sustainable set of policies in these areas where federal land and federal water can make common cause a coalition where the mill worker in Roseburg, the oil rig worker in Louisiana, the Sierra Club member in Colorado, and fishing families and wind energy developers in New England can sit down together and find a way to come up with sensible, balanced resources policies and get some of the revenue that is generated from those policies so that those rural communities don't become ghost towns. That is the challenge. And I just close, if Pat's on his feet, that means I'm supposed to be either off mind or wrap up, with one kind of thought. I started describing where we've been and I hope you've got a little bit of a sense of where we can go, how we're poised to make history again. We need to make energy in Oregon and America, and we need more sensible natural resources policies. And I think we can do it in a way that produces cleaner, more renewable energy for the environment and the economy. And what it comes down to is whether we are willing to step up and do what Oregon has done best. What we have done best is lead in the area of natural resources and energy policies for decades now, and it's time to do it again. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Senator Wyden. It's a, it's a joy for all Oregonians to know that you're in this important leadership role dealing with these grave and interesting issues. So good luck in your new role in the committee. And now, if you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high so that City Club staff can collect it from you. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today's Friday Forum host, John Horvick, who works at DHM Research 
Since joining City Club in 2004, John has volunteered on the research board, chaired the new Leaders Council, and served on the Friday Forum Committee and the Board of Governors. He is currently the club's president-elect. John? I, I would also note that I'm a mere legislator, and you're, you're going to be president as of next week, right? Good. Senator, I'd like to ask you a, sort of a fundamental question about whether or not many of these good proposals you brought to us today can actually become law. Your colleague and Oregon's junior senator, Jeff Merkley, has been advocating for filibuster reform. Do you believe that significant and meaningful energy policy can pass the Senate without reforming the Senate's filibuster rules? And specifically, do you support Senator Merkley's proposals? What Senator Merkley is doing in terms of holding senators accountable, I think, is a very smart and very necessary idea. As you know, he is in the middle of negotiations now with the majority leader and various other kinds of senators. And what almost always happens is uh, you come up with something to try to bring the sides together. But the basic proposition that senators should be personally accountable is indisputable. And I think I want to put this in a kind of sort of topical way, and that is one year ago to this day, an enormous victory was won for the cause of internet freedom. Against all the odds, when all the money was on the side of Hollywood and the recording industry and the Chamber of Commerce, because they all said that we should fight piracy, people stealing stuff, and it wasn't that big a deal that it would harm the architecture of the internet, that everybody thought big money was just going to blow through the city, and that our side, the side of internet freedom, would prevail. And I blocked that bill. I blocked it for two years. And I said, because I believe what Senator Merkley is talking about is spot on, I said I will go to the floor of the United States Senate and I will stay there through the fight. It's kind of interesting. People started sending soup and crackers from Oregon. And they all said, Ron is so skinny, he's going to die out there or something like that. But you know, the point is, there are ways to hold senators personally accountable. And not only is what Senator Merkley talking about correct, but it also is one of the keys to producing change. Because during that period where we said we would take the floor and be personally accountable, 15 million Americans, 15 million Americans, six days before the vote, emailed and called and wrote and said, do not unravel the architecture of the internet just to deal with what was another legitimate problem. It was a legitimate problem, but it had such huge downsides that adopting this course would have been a great mistake. And had we not been willing to do what Senator Merkley says is what the Senate ought to be about, we wouldn't have won that fight. And I think that kind of approach bringing citizens in, particularly on issues that allow them to use their voices online is critical. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that senators are held personally accountable on Senator Merkley's proposal and on a variety of others that are coming up. We will, we will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask your questions. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question as directly as possible. If I flash this little question mark, it means please wrap up your question. Wynn Wakala, City Club member. Thank you, Ron, for all. <laughs> You. I can never find I'm over here. <laughs> people are out in cyberspace somewhere. Good. Thank you for all your work fighting human trafficking. Uh, we, looked at, we look at trains, we look at trucks, you know, delivering goods, and of course truck drivers and truck stops are a bad place for human trafficking. 
and we would love to have more trains and that would also be more energy efficient. Can you tell us any good news about human trafficking and any efforts towards working towards more trains? The, the question about you know, human trafficking is particularly relevant for us because the I-5 corridor has been a major, major artery for the bad guys. They have looked at every kind of opportunity because there are big distances with some of the cutbacks in law enforcement. They can affect, and, and you see this when you talk to the you know, young women who have these you know, huge knives that they have to have just to defend themselves. And my hope is, because you and other advocates have done such good work, that we can move beyond sort of getting bits and pieces of legislation passed. As you know, we've been able to make um, some, some progress, particularly in terms of assisting law enforcement. But the big lift is to have a comprehensive system that has shelters for the women that you're talking about. If you're going to get those women in a position to really go after the pimps, who are the big offenders here, they so often need the kind of shelters and the ability to get their health back and to work with counselors and have those shelters. So we're going to push very hard for a comprehensive effort against human trafficking in this session of Congress. And the centerpiece is the question of having adequate shelters. You, Diane McKeel, the county commissioner um, from Multnomah County, have done great work. And I'm going to do everything I can to make the federal government a better partner for you. Thank you, Debbie Lynn Molino, City Club member. I have many questions, but I'm going to narrow it to one. Um, what are the na major challenges and or um, benefits right now that you see with the national park system and what's happening there? Well, the nas national parks, of, of course, are an American, American treasure. The biggest challenge, of course, is upkeep. What we see continually, and people tell me when they go on a particular summer trip, is a look at what I saw, and it was trash or what have you. And we're going to make a priority trying to move the public lands bills in this Congress. Last year, and it's apropos of Pat's comment about gridlock, last year was the first year when there was not a public lands package. That is not a boast that Congress can actually um, go public with uh, as a big, a big accomplishment. To not have bipartisan public you know, lands, lands legislation is really an indictment about what happens when the partisanship, the excessive partisanship gets uh, really out, out of hand. Senator Murkowski has made it clear that she wants to change that. She will be the senior Republican that uh, we have on uh, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and I think we have a chance to do some really important work, some work that addresses the public lands issue. And while I mention Senator Murkowski, I'd like to take note of something that happened a couple of weeks ago that I think is hugely important for the cause of better government. Senator Murkowski joined me for the first time in more than a decade in a major proposal to change the disgraceful campaign finance system in our country. We have, we have really not had a bipartisan campaign finance reform proposal since the McCain-Feingold days. And last year's vote on the Disclose Act, just to disclose the amount of money spent on political campaigns, was completely partisan. So Senator Murkowski and I went to work, and not only would there be required disclosure of all major donations by all parties to political campaigns, we would, again, for the first time, go after what is a huge and growing abuse. You all have heard about the super PACs. Everybody knows about that. An even greater abuse is now there are organizations that call themselves social welfare organizations, get tax breaks with your money, 
and basically go out and spend money, huge sums, on political campaigns without disclosing it. Senator Murkowski and I are going to crack down on that abuse as well, and that is high time. So that's a longer answer than you wanted when you asked about parks. But. Uh, Chris Andre, City Club member. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, you have no idea how good it is to hear that in uh, a room uh, full of a lot of familiar faces and, and hear the applause. This is, this is great. Uh, I have a lot of questions too. And I also want to thank you for your leadership when it came down to reauthorization of FISA, at the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I have other questions about surveillance, but um, to return to your uh, remarks about original remarks about growth and um, what boils down to environment versus industry, I think it's important to ask the question: How much growth can we afford? There is planned growth, which is what you're referring to, and there's the unplanned type of growth that's a result of climate change, where we will find ourselves inundated with uh, what amount to climate refugees. How much growth is, is you, you can't have infinite growth, no matter how well you, you, um, you handle natural resources, it has to stop somewhere. And uh, we cannot afford extractive Industries, whether it's importing it, it's one world. So whether we export problems or import good ideas, it's, it comes down to what can we sustain? How much is enough? I am. Um, I'll duck the Oregon parts of that issue because, as you know, that's also part of our pioneering tradition, where we started wrestling back in the days of Tom McCall with trying to have the nation's best land use laws, and we try to cope with those issues, the urban growth boundaries and metro and a variety of, of other kinds of ways, and sort of stick to the federal you know, aspects of this you know, whole issue. I think Oregon has taught the country that good environmental policy creates more jobs, not less. And again, and then again and again, when I get around the, the state, and we had a big bunch of town hall meetings here you know, recently, I see these examples. You look at the biomass facilities in eastern Oregon. This is a chance, folks, to go in there and thin out some of the millions and millions of acres of overstocked timber stands, get them to the mills, like Ochico and Boise and the mills that are in eastern you know, Oregon, and then it turns up in an energy system, in a heating system, in a small school in eastern Oregon where it's so clean, you almost feel you can have your sandwich on the floor. It's extraordinary. So let us continue as we've had done in Oregon to try to lead the country in issues like land use and growth boundaries and have those kinds of debates. But let's also insist that the federal government pick up on our message, which is good environmental policy is good for the economy. And certainly, in eastern Oregon, you see that where forest health equals a healthy economy. And we ought to promote it every chance we get. Don Wagoner, a City Club member. And I appreciated your, uh, no, number one, it's great to see all the applause you're getting, <laughs> okay? I'm clapping too. You better quit while I'm ahead. Uh, say again, please. Keith, kidding. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that there were a lot of uh, uh, negatives that were coming as the natural gas seems to take over. Fracking is is a kind of a four-letter word. Uh, it's uh, uh, and I don't think we know enough about it to go in as as uh, strongly as we are into uh, fracking to get uh, gas. What is your position with regard to this? We're going to dig into it very thoroughly on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And let me just give you my early kind of take. First of all, not all fracking is created equal. There is fracking, for example, back east, which looks very close to the water table 
and looks like it is a very significant environmental issue. There is other fracking that takes place way, way down, very far removed from the water table. So there are a host of issues that are associated with it. I certainly favor disclosure of the fracking chemicals. That ought to be information that's available throughout our country. So these are issues that are not going to be glossed over. I mentioned fracking and the aquifers and methane gas. They're important issues. But I think working together in a practical, focused kind of way, we can look at natural gas as part of what can be good for the economy, play a transition role so that we can start using more renewable energy sources. And that's what I'm going to be trying to do. Let me ask uh, a question from uh, the audience who was written on one of the cards. Nobody has asked about any of the cliffs, fiscal cliff, this cliff, that <laughs> cliff. I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. We'll give them a chance. They may have an opportunity. But this was a question about please state your position on the export of coal through the Columbia Gorge to Asian power plants. The question of exporting coal also fits into this big basket of the issues that have not been addressed as part of this transformative set of changes that is so recent. We need an export policy for our country that looks at jobs and the environment and prices, and by the way, also national security. And I was up in the gorge yesterday, and uh, we were having town meetings. We were talking about fruit. And we love sending our fruit uh, around the world. Pears are not a national security issue. Energy is. So we really need a policy, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. For example, you may have seen that Senator Murkowski and I asked the government to investigate the whole question of royalty payments that coal companies are paying when they extract coal off federal land. And it really is a question that nobody has dug into, and it raises the question of whether taxpayers are getting fleeced. And if you read the piece in the paper yesterday, Essentially, what the company said is, we kind of use this in-house lessee, and we say the price for the coal is what the in-house lessee is paying, rather than the price that is much higher when it goes to Asia. So what I'm saying is, before we start a big effort in this area of energy policy, this area of energy exports, my approach is we're going to look before we leap. Senator, uh, I'm Robert McCullough, City Club member. Of neighbor in East Moreland. And my first point is to congratulate you on the growth in the Wyden family. Thank you. <laughs> Pict pictures of Scarlett available on my iPhone after the meeting. <laughs> Over the last few years, we've seen the lowest energy prices in U.S. history for electricity, natural gas, and coal. All of those fuels are subject to FERC oversight and market surveillance. We've also simultaneously seen the highest prices for gasoline in our history, even though gasoline oil production is exploding and oil demand is declining. Uh, will the Senate Energy Committee look into adding some sort of market surveillance to oil and gasoline, an area that has never had any? Bob, you and, and Senator Cantwell in particular have been raising very important you know, issues and particularly some of these questions that you have raised about what happened when refineries were down and, and and the effect on, on prices are extremely important. And yes, we are going to dig into those issues. I think the work that you've done and the work that you and Senator Cantwell have done uh, together is extremely uh, important. It's just wonderful to have a neighbor who's also a national leader in the effort to make sure that we dig into these pricing issues and the question of market surveillance. And I'm going to work very closely with you. 
Another question from the audience, the written question. Can we expect any congressional action on gun control? Question was about gun, gun control. Here's, here's my sense of, of where we are. And, and first, as the parent of three children under six, it is almost impossible to try to imagine the horror of those parents in Connecticut. You send your kids off to school in the morning and then four or five hours later all the hopes and dreams you have for the house are, are, are shattered. It's just almost impossible to imagine. And of course this isn't just Connecticut. It isn't just something in the east. It's Thurston in our state. It's Clackamas Town Center. Town Center very close to where Bob and I are in East Moreland. So it's not just, it's not just back east, it's, ev it's everywhere. And it's also very personal because my brother was a schizophrenic. He died way too young. Like so many schizophrenics, he was very, very intelligent. And there wasn't a day that went by, not a day that went by, when we weren't worried that he was going to hurt himself or he was going to hurt somebody else. And the mental health system is a key part of this whole discussion. What I think the Congress is going to have to wrestle with now, Pat, is to try to find a set of policies that I call gun sense. In other words, when you turn on any kind of program, the first question is, are you for gun control or are you against gun control? I think the question is going to be, are you for gun sense? And gun sense means a better balancing of rights and responsibilities, which is what the founding fathers had in mind. And you see it through all the amendments. The First Amendment, this wonderful amendment about free speech, it's so important to our country, but you don't get to shout fire in a crowded theater because people can get hurt and they get and get trampled. And the Second Amendment also, in my view, is about rights and responsibilities. So let me just tick off a few of them that you know, come to mind. We've got to have a background system, a system of background checks that works. How somebody who is seriously mentally impaired can get a military-style rifle with a high-capacity magazine is just wrong. And we ought to have a background check system that ensures that doesn't happen. We ought to have a system of storing weapons, offices and homes. And we're seeing questions with the tragedy in Connecticut with respect to how uh, that individual who committed those crimes um, was getting access to the weapons. So I mean, that too is about personal responsibility. We ought to have rules with respect to transferring weapons. Because right now, often, people use a straw person, somebody who couldn't buy a gun, and they use a straw person to get the gun, and then off they go. So those three things, in my view, are gun sense. They're about rights and responsibilities. The other issues are going to get lots of debate as well. I think the question on the assault weapon issue is going to be how do you define the assault weapon? Because when you listen to the discussion, there are some assault weapons that kind of sound like what people are using in Eastern Oregon on a regular basis. So the question is really the function of the weapon. I think there also is a strong case for some limits on these magazines. Why in the world somebody who's mentally disturbed doesn't even, in effect, have to reload, I think, again, represents an area where Democrats and Republicans can come together. It's going to be about gun sense. And I think it's clear, like so many issues, and, and the reason I brought up Pippa and Sopa is because that's now a new model for grassroots involvement. 15 million people changed the Congress. Before the citizens weighed in, the other side was going to get 80 votes, folks. 
they were going to get 80 votes. Everybody said, Ron's going to talk a few minutes, and then we're going to get 80 votes. And the citizens changed that. And I think what happens on guns, to a great extent, Pat, is going to be about what the people of this country do in terms of weighing in on this debate and weighing in on, on, on the specifics. And I think when the dust settles on the gun con control debate, the people of this country are going to have the last word in what happens, and I sure hope you speak out loud and clear. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for further questions, and we're going to have to stop for the day. Please join us next week to hear Steve Wright, Chief Executive of the Bonneville Power Administration. And as we close today, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to today's speaker, Senator Ron Wyden. Here we go.